So welcome, and thank you for coming to our seminar today. Uh, today we're going to talk about the truth about spending your nest egg, and we're really looking forward to some great information, and uh, look forward to your, your strong questions. This is a, a subject matter that tends to lend to specific personal mm -hmm. questions, and we're going to defer those to the end, so if you have general questions, that's great. Um, our panelists are going to stay behind afterwards. They're going to answer all your questions. They can set appointments to meet with you. Um, and so you'll get taken care of, don't worry. The good news today is probably every one of us is on Social Security. <clears throat> We're probably receiving Medicare benefits to cover our medical costs. We may have a pension, though there are not a lot of those left. Um, and we uh, are probably receiving our minimum distribution from whatever retirement we have, whether it's an IRA or one of the 40 plans. Uh, we're getting our minimum distribution, or about to get our minimum distribution for that. The bad news is, what we have is what we're going to get. We're not going to get a merit increase on our Social Security. We're not going to get a promotion because we worked real hard and got, got down to the bank right away when our Social Security posted and spent. Um, the next thing is that, that Medicare only covers medical. Medicare doesn't cover assisted living. So it's limited in what it covers. Uh, the next thing is that even though uh, we may have a pension, most pension plans have a very poor cost of living adjustment. As we all know, Social Security has a cost of living adjustment, and we can like it, don't like it, complain about it, but we have no control over what that is. And then our retirement savings plans are only as good as the amount of money that we put in them. And the, the, the next piece of what is good news on one side and not so good news on others, is we're living a lot longer. If we're age 70, we're expected to live to age 85 to 87. If we're age 80, we're expected to live 88 to 90. And if we've hit 85, we're gonna live into our 90s. So we're living a lot longer than our parents and grandparents did. So our money has to last a lot longer. And 58% of retirements say they have a financial plan, but only 18% have it right, which means only 18% have a financial plan. And so I think what we're gonna talk about today is gonna be a lot of value. Now, this is personal to me, and, and to Lynn also, because we ended up managing our parents' money. And in my case, uh, my parents divorced when I was young. Uh, they lived in separate states. Um, my father, uh, lived many years after he developed Alzheimer's dementia, and I managed his money. Uh, my mother uh, developed uh, vascular dementia in her later years, um, and I managed her money. Now, they had different needs, they had different requirements, they had different amount of money, and we made it last, and we made it last for one reason, and one reason only. I found good financial planners, and I worked with them to develop a written plan so that we made sure that mom and dad's money lasted for their benefit. So uh, with that said, will you guys please introduce yourselves? Hi, I am Dana Richmond, and I am a financial advisor with Evershore Financial Group. We are a firm in Maitland. Uh, I'm Sean Williams, also a financial advisor with Evershore Financial Group. Um, we focus on comprehensive financial planning, investment management, insurance planning, um, and all the, all the other fun stuff that comes along with finances inevitably. Um, but we're excited to be here. Uh, Sean and Dana are with Evershore, and they are um, two of our uh, partners, educational partners in this series, and we thank you guys very much for doing that. And you guys are partners in business. We are, yeah. We have so about you, 18 advisors um, at our location here that Sean and I are both so when you work with Sean or Don, Dana, you're working with Sean and Dana. Yeah, we do a lot of joint work in our office because we think it makes sense. Kind of goes back to planning. What if something happens to the <coughs> advisor? It makes sense to have another advisor aware of what's happening to somebody. So why don't we get some definitions out of the way? What is a financial advisor? Yeah, this is, a, this is an important one. Um, there are so many terms for people that help manage money. And it gets to be confusing, and I think it's a real problem in our industry. Um, some of you might have heard financial advisors, some of you might have heard financial planners, money managers, wealth managers, investment managers. And when it all boils down to it, 
you as consumers really need to understand the licenses that those people hold. They can choose to use whatever title they want to, whatever speaks to their practice, but it's really important to know that they hold specific licenses. Um, so for the general consumer, it's very important that they've held, they've taken a series of exams called the Series 7 and the Series 66. Why that is important is because if they have taken these series of exams and hold these licenses, they can act as a fiduciary. Um, I'm gonna talk about that too, because I think that's really important also. Uh, fiduciary has become a buzzword in the industry, if you will, and what all it boils down to is that a, fi a fiduciary is legally bound to work on the sole benefit of the client, which sounds like not rocket science, right? That's what we should all be doing. Um, but it's important to note when even someone licensed, like Sean and I and like many of you work with, we're not acting as a fiduciary if you need something um, like a product, if you need long-term care, if you at a younger age needed life insurance, disability insurance. When, when there's a exchange of money of a product being sold, your advisor can't work as a fiduciary because they have an invested interest. But the whole point and the, what you want to know is that they can legally be a fiduciary because they hold these licenses. So I know that gets a little confusing, but you want to work with somebody that can act as a fiduciary. So we hear this all the time. We're with somebody and we'll say uh, they're, they're looking at making a financial decision because a lot of the community kind of, uh, of changes that people make, they're going to spend money or they're trying to figure out how much money they have and they say, oh, I went down to the bank. Now, I'm not trying to pick on banks. I was in the banking industry for a long time. But I went down to the bank. I mean, he's such a nice young man. And I met with him or she's such a nice young lady. And they told me I'm okay. Are they a fiduciary? No. Um, so your bankers in the community are awesome resources and a, and a big part of your, you know, money system and your overall financial picture, but they are not financial advisors. They are not fiduciaries. Now, there might be somebody at the bank that is a financial advisor, but the person that you're just speaking with at the bank is not a financial advisor. If you want to seek out advice from someone separate from that. And so the person in the branch is most likely not a financial advisor. I think that's a very important point because we hear people tell us they go to a branch. I'm, I'm, I know I'm picking on banks here, but I'm, I'm, it's important. And I talked to that nice young man, that nice young lady, and they told me this is what I need to do. Well, that's all well and good, but their job is to sell product. Their job is not to provide financial advice. And to the extent they do so, you're taking a big risk. So is that, did yeah, we cover that okay? Absolutely, and I think it's, it's important to note if you're working with someone that you, you totally trust, but you don't know what licenses they hold, you can go to BrokerCheck, you can Google that. BrokerCheck, it's, I think it's brokercheck.finra.com, and you can put in the person's name, you can put in the firm they work with, you can search by a lot of different ways but it will, it will pull up their information and tell you exactly what licenses they hold. And that's a surefire way, no matter what they call themselves, to know exactly who they are and what um, education they've had to be able to advise you. And the other thing is just asking mm -hmm. what, what their credentials are, so, so you know. Um, so Sean, plan, 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 right? So, What's a financial plan? I mean, I, I said put it on paper. Well, I can write down that I have so much money and I have these bills, so that's a financial plan, right? Uh, so the technical answer is a financial plan is a comprehensive evaluation of someone's personal finances and then strategies for long-term goals, how to meet those goals. Um, an easier way to look at it is kind of like a home inspection. So. Home, you get a home inspection, it tells you the current state of your home and any major or minor issues that there might be. 
a financial plan is kind of the same thing for your finances, right? It's a snapshot of this is where we are today, this is the direction we're heading, and then an evaluation of is this the direction that's gonna get us to our um, goals, needs, and wants. Um, it's a advice-driven relationship that allows the advisor to make recommendations based on real information, and then it's up to the client on whether or not you want to implement the recommendations or not implement the recommendations, but it also allows the client to make informed decisions based on their actual information. Um, you know, we see people making you know, major or minor financial decisions completely independent of each other. So someone will do something with a piece of their assets over here without thinking about how it affects something over here or really the whole puzzle. Um, having a financial plan consolidates everything into one place and then you can see how each decision impacts everything. Um, one thing I do want to mention about financial plans, um, kind of falling back on the fiduciary uh, discussion, is um, if you're paying someone a fee for a to do a financial plan for you, they're typically acting in a fiduciary capacity. Uh, and I, the reason I bring this up is I have, you know, I see advertisements or people, you know, tell me, you know, so and so will do a financial plan for free. I just got to go in for a meeting. Um, I would approach those situations uh, with a little bit of caution just because if they're doing something for free, uh, they're incentivized to get paid by working with you in another, ma in another manner. So their advice may not be um, as necessarily um, as objective as you'd like in a planning situation. Um, some other things I hear, well. Oh. Well, I want to touch on that. Yeah. I want to come back to something else. It, it's interesting because we have no problem paying here at Carfish, the plumber. Uh, the doctor, our attorney. I mean, we pay attorneys a lot of money, right? Um, but what I hear this all the time. They want to charge me to do a financial plan. I mean, that's ridiculous. Why would I do that? Because it's probably the most important thing you're going to do. It is hugely important. It brings me around to the next thing. So you build this great financial plan, and something happens, and there's no one around who can implement it. So do you get into the other legal documents involved, like a power of attorney? Yeah. So... You know, one of the you know whole goals of planning is to uh, discuss life events before they happen, right? And plan for them. You, know, you want to avoid avoidable surprises. Um, so estate planning is always a discussion early on in the financial planning process. Um, you discuss you know, naming beneficiaries, uh, creating power of attorney documents, uh, wills. Um, making sure someone, if they need passwords to certain things, will have access to them in the future if necessary, uh, creating trusts, successor trustees, all kinds of things. Um, and if someone is um, you know, unable to, uh, let's say something happens and they need access to these documents, those are also documents that can be shared with the advisor, because as an advisor, we're there to help guide you through situations. So um, you're looking at life insurance and yeah. It's, the point I want to make is it's, it, this is extremely comprehensive. It's every asset, liability, um, income, very detailed expenses, uh, everything in, involved in your finances. Is it, they want to uncover everything and give you the best financial plan possible. The, so, I'm sorry, the recommendations we were, we're making are based off of your information. So our recommendations are only as good as the information we have. If the information's incomplete, then in the future, maybe our recommendations won't make as much sense because we didn't have the complete picture initially. Uh, we ran into this actually yesterday. Uh, we we're working with a couple that moved to the retirement community and we're preparing their, uh, all the things that have to happen after they move and we're working on getting their house ready to sell. And um, we, we get this all the time. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Well, what they forgot to tell me about the leaky roof is of very little importance in the end game. What you forget to tell them about your financials and trust and documents and powers of attorney and life insurance and life with long-term health care is crucial. So you've got to make sure they have everything in hand. Which leads into um, a lot of our folks uh, have long-term care insurance. And how does that factor into a financial plan? Long-term care is a huge part of your financial plan, um, especially now that, you know, you all mentioned how much older everyone is living, which is awesome, um, but it becomes 
um, it becomes expensive as we get older. Also, our adult children are oftentimes not living close to us, or if they are living close to us, they, you know, they're in a dual working family with young children and, um, you know, just creating your wishes and understanding that moving in with your children might not be the best option, it might not be what you want. Um, Long-term care plays a huge role in that, a huge role. So is there an age beyond which getting long-term care insurance doesn't make sense? So there, this is a total uh, financial advisor, attorney type of answer. It depends. <laughs> um, you know, what I would say is the earlier, the better, which I don't think is a surprise to anyone in this room. Um, getting long-term care earlier is better. 75 is kind of a cutoff. It's a loose cutoff. Um, there might still be options after that age, um, but it gets a lot tougher for us as advisors to match you up with what type of long-term care might be right. What I'll say is that if you initially researched long-term care many years ago, or you went through the experience with a loved one or a parent, the options of long-term care have really, really changed. Um, if you looked out into it in the past, it might have been only a monthly premium that was not guaranteed, um, you know, definitely could have been escalating over time, and it could have also been, if you didn't use it, you lost it. Right? And that was kind of tricky, especially if you were younger, of what no, but not having that crystal ball that we all want, right, as we're approaching aging and retirement. But now, it is so different. Um, so if you have considered long-term care in the past and you felt like it wasn't right for you, chances are there's a new type of policy that could be right for you. There are ways to just move a lump sum of money and not have it be a monthly premium. There are ways that it can be paid if you don't use it. Um, you know, say we go peacefully in our sleep, you know, right after an important diagnosis or any other type of dream. Um, you're, it can be paid, the money that you put into the policy can be paid as a death benefit to a loved one. It can be a monthly premium that gets paid really quickly over time. There are just so many options. If you have a health um, you know, situation that you don't think you could go through a full underwriting, there are policies for that. Um, so I hope that you're hearing me that there really are options out there. And um, the most important thing is that you need it. And we all get to there at some point Many of us have the experience of watching a parent have long-term care and being really thankful that they had it. And so now you had that experience and you're like, okay, well, I'm clearly gonna get long-term care. I was so thankful that my parents had, had this when they went through it. Or the opposite, right? You watched your parents not have long-term care and you are determined to not do that to whomever is caring for you. But at the end of the day, we all get to long-term care, and it's just a matter of taking care of it while the options are still available. Um, when I got into this industry, um, my aunt, um, who had watched her mom not have long-term care, and her and her um, two siblings, my mom and her brother, my uncle, they got long-term care for themselves. They were in their early 50s. A mix-up happened when my aunt sold her company. She thought the new owners were gonna pay the premium. I'm not really sure why she thought that, but she did. And we, we all know that if you don't pay a premium, the insurance company's gonna cancel your policy, right? We know that. So her policy got canceled. And when I got into the industry, she said, you know, I've been thinking that I'm just gonna self-pay. And I said, come again? What, what are you thinking you're gonna do? Now my aunt had a really successful career, um, divorced, um, so caring for herself financially, but was quite successful. 
And I made the analogy, I said, hey, you know, I'm just getting into this industry. I know that I have a lot to learn, but I know that if you're out shopping, wherever she shops, right, and they say there's a 25% off sale, she's not going up to the counter and say, oh, no, no, I'll pay full price, right? <laughs> Nobody does that. But that's what self-paying is. That's using dollar for dollar for long-term care. And what long-term care insurance does is it hedges your dollar. So there is no greater investment as we age, especially now that there are options that if you don't use the benefit, it gets paid to a beneficiary. So long-term care is very <laughs> Now we, we get this question. Um, I've got this policy, it's escalating, I've had a policy for kind of about 30 years, and I think I'm gonna just drop it. If they already have a policy, and it's in place, and they're paying for it, is just dropping it a real smart idea? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to more, more eloquently answer that. You need the coverage, the statistics, people are living longer, all the things that we've already said. So if you have a policy in place, Seek out some financial advice. Talk to your financial advisor about how to make your money last in other ways so that nothing happens to that policy. Um, you know, again, the life insurance companies, because people are living longer, they want the business. They want to earn your business, and they've gotten very creative in their offerings in a good way. That's creative in a good way to compete with each other and make it right for you as consumers. So don't do anything to your existing policy, but that's a perfect place to seek out some financial advice. And part of that financial advice is going to be taking a very hard look at the policy you have and knowing when it kicks in, how it kicks in, what it covers, what it doesn't cover, which is critically important. Uh, we see people who don't take advantage of their long-term care policy. So they're spending money out of pocket. They're going to the counter and saying, no, I'll I don't take the discount. When they have a, a care policy in place, they could be using. So that all comes out in the financial plan. So an, another thing that we, we see is that uh, most of us, uh, if we have a mortgage, it's pretty small, but most of us don't have a mortgage. We have a lot of equity sitting in the house. So um, what's the equity in the house? How's that factor into your, your financial plan, Sean? Yeah, um, so typically, uh, I think most of us know someone's largest or or the largest asset someone has is their house. Um, on the flip side, maybe it doesn't apply to this room, but it can also be the largest liability or debt someone has. So it can play a very important factor in the financial plan. Um, it, but it also depends on kind of what stage someone's at in life. So in a retirement situation, if you know, the plan is to retire and downsize or move to like a you know, retirement community, um, it's kind of just a traditional planning, right? Or traditional use of the equities where you're selling the house, um, taking the equity, and then you meet with your financial advisor, come up with a strategy of what's the best use of the equity. Um, in maybe the later stages, um, or later in life, if the situation is where you have equity in the home, but you have to sell the home because you're moving into an assisted living community, or there's a long-term care situation, um, that's a little more specialized planning, right? We're planning for a very specific situation that's happening in the short term. So we're looking at, you know, the whole picture, right? So it's kind of the theme of financial planning is the big picture. Um, so what is the long-term care insurance situation? What other assets are available? What's the cost of the community or the care? Um, and then what's the best use of that equity, right? What's the best place to put it for, to create, to last long enough to cover what you'll need for your life, the rest of your life. Um, they're um, a little more complicated of a situation with equity in the home would be if um, you know you want or need the equity but you also want to stay in the house um, there are some different options available in that scenario you can do the traditional home equity loan um, or second mortgage there's a home equity line of credit where you're opening a line of credit based on the equity you have in the home that's available to you as needed um, and the, the third option is a reverse mortgage where you are taking out a loan against the equity in the home, but unlike a traditional loan, the homeowner's not paying the lender, the lender is making a payment or a series of payments to the homeowner. Um, 
Those options are um, a little more complicated. It kind of depends on the situation the person's in. Um, but before kind of making a decision on any of those, there should be careful thought given, right? Because those will change your debt situation. They all have different rules and regulations around them. Um, so you just need to do you know, thoughtful planning before jumping into any of those things because you don't want to do something um, and then later on kind of maybe figure out maybe that wasn't the most appropriate decision. So uh, if someone is, is looking to move to a retirement community, mm -hmm. independent living, assisted living, a uh, Mayflower, Westminster kind of community, and um, that equity could be used to fund that mm -hmm. retirement community, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So um, what we see with the, the home equity conversion mortgage or reverse mortgage, it's called also, is that quite often one like that, that's, um, people will use the equity now to the point there's none left and then they need to move and they need to sell and they need the money that they already spent so they're selling their home and there's very little equity left and they, they have removed any option they have at that point so you, you've got to be really really careful with those meet with a financial advisor before you do it uh, the second thing is we were working with a lady, um, she was moving to a retirement community, and she, uh, we got her moved and settled and everything, and we're dealing with her house, and we get it sold at the closing, and, and she was a fascinating lady. She was born in Munich, Germany in 1930. Went through a couple of events in the 1940s, and told us about them, it's horrifying and fascinating at the same time, and so she sold her house, and uh, had about $350,000 at the closing. A lot of money. I said to her, What are you going to do? With that? Oh, I'm going down the bank putting my checking account. Just leave it there. Yeah. Probably not the smartest thing. Financial advisor would, would walk her through um, where best to put that and, and have it invested for, to her benefit. Um, so if there's a financial plan in place with a professional manager, what happens when the person is no longer to manage it on their own? So they become incapacitated through uh, health, dementia, whatever it might be. So, and like I mentioned before, um, the whole idea of planning is to discuss these life events that could happen ahead of time and planning for them ahead of time. Um, so if there's a situation where someone's incapacitated or they pass away, um, you know, planning is predominantly done by couples, right? Married couples will create a financial plan together. Um, so if one spouse, has a health issue and, or they do pass away. Because they've done a plan, the surviving spouse knows what the plan is, they know where all the documents are, um, and so does the advisor, right? So like I said before, power of attorney documents, estate documents are all things that should be shared with the advisor, so they have a copy of it on file, just in case it's needed. Um, and in that scenario too, um, because there's an advisor that you've worked with, the spouse or the surviving spouse isn't going to have to go through all the steps that need to be taken alone. They have the advisor to help guide them. Um, now, if there's a scenario where either both spouses are incapacitated or they both pass away, um, then it can be up to the people who are named in power of attorneys or um, trustees uh, or successor trustees. Uh, it's kind of a similar scenario. They should be made aware ahead of time that they've been named in these documents and kind of what the role is. Um, but the advisor is also there to help guide them. Uh, now, if there's no planning done, things can get a lot messier and chaotic in those situations. So, you need to think ahead of time, what would someone need if, you know, I am in a car accident, I'm in a coma, or I have a memory, a cognitive issue, or I pass away. What would they need? They would need access to documents, where are the documents, they need access to passwords on computers, um, and you know who your state attorneys are. So let's say mom, or let's say dad's passed away, mom's in the hospital, incapacitated, I need to get documents on her computer, but I don't know the password to get into your computer. What do you do? Um, you don't have copies of power of attorney's documents, you don't have estate documents, you don't know who their financial advisor is, you don't know who their estate attorney is, who do you call? Um, if uh, you, need to, they, you need to get in their bank accounts, you don't have, you're not named on the accounts, you're not a beneficiary, 
how do you get into the bank accounts? If it's a cognitive issue, you have to get a court order deeming them mentally incapacitated, then take it to the bank. If they pass away, the account goes through probate, then the executor of the will um, has access to the accounts after it's gone through the process. So not planning, it's more stressful, more time consuming, and if, say you have to go through probate, it's, um, it's costly as well, probate's not free. Um, so just for an example, um, I've been working with four daughters for the last two years or so. Uh, their mother was diagnosed with a aggressive early onset cognitive disorder and they wanted to do a financial plan before um, she had to go into a memory care unit to kind of make sure that she's taken care of. Um, and one of the first things we did was update her power of attorney and um, trust documents because the person listed on those documents at that point was her deceased husband, which doesn't do anyone any good at that time. So got them updated and then we helped make sure each institution, so banks, investment institutions, insurance companies had copies of the power of attorney, which gives them the um, authority to have access to the information and to transact in those accounts. Um, and you know, unfortunately, they actually just had to move their mom into a memory care unit in the last couple weeks. Um, and the fact that all of that was done at a time made a you know a situation that's already extremely difficult and emotional. I'm not going to say better, but it didn't add unnecessary stress on top of it. For where they're scrambling to have to do all these things, they're able to focus on what's more important and you know making sure their their mom's taken care of. Because it's it's a it's an emotional situation having to, to do that with family member. So. And a side benefit to the financial plan is getting all the other legal documents up, updated too. And yeah. don't hold up your hand, please, but think to yourself. How many of you have a, a power of attorney or trust document that's uh, put in place more than 10 years ago? How many of you have a financial or power of attorney or trust document that has not been reviewed by an attorney in the last five years? More and most importantly, how many of you have a, a power of attorney will trust document that was not designed, put in place, and done by a board certified elder law attorney. Because if you didn't get it done with a board certified elder law attorney, that's like going to your general practitioner to have a knee replacement. Trust documents, powers of attorney, wills, those are very specific documents that have very specific requirements to be done correctly. And we see them done wrong all the time. It it's not only creates problems, it creates huge financial issues that can be caused. So, on to the next one. Are we getting too serious? <laughs> on to the next one. It, it, maybe this plays into being too serious, or not serious enough, but what about the psychology of planning and not planning? Some people just, you know, I don't want to plan. Um, I had a relative, that would be my father, say, Paul, you know what, it's going to be your problem. And I said, thanks, Dad. So what about the psychology of, of the planning and not planning? You guys deal with far more than we do. We do. I mean, I think Sean and I both feel as though some of our job is also part therapist. <laughs> um, whether it's marriage counselor, whether it's family therapist, whether it's grief counseling, you know, whatever. We're definitely on the inner fold of, of people's lives. And beyond our health, really, money is is very close up there on level of importance in terms of quality of life. Um, and the psychology of planning or not planning, it's emotional. Money is emotional. Um, and it doesn't get easier as we get older and we're making these really important decisions. Um, so, you know, what I always like to encourage my clients to understand is that not planning is still a plan. It's just not a good one. <laughs> You're choosing, you are making an active choice to not plan. And like Paul's father, that is a choice to put your burdens on someone else. Someone's going to have to handle things when that time comes. And anyone surrounding you, your loved ones, they want to facilitate your wishes with your money as it relates to your money. Obviously, they want to facilitate your wishes as it relates to so many things as we age. But it takes money to, to facilitate 
and and everybody wants to do right by you, but if they don't know what your wishes are, it's very hard to get it right. Um, so the planning, you know, I mean, talking about finances, talking about end of life, uh, you know, sometimes we feel like grim reapers. We talk about it so much, but what we're really trying to do is have you all feel empowered that it's taken care of. And yes, it's not the sexy conversation, it's not the fun conversation, it's not the where are we going out to eat or where are we going on our next vacation, but it's far more important. Um, and so, you know, just remember, not planning is still a plan. And as I said in my opening remarks, what we have now is what we have, unless we know we're winning water, unless we know Aunt Gertrude, Gertrude has five million dollars waiting for us so let's make a plan to make what we have work best for us otherwise if you're driving down a dark road with the headlights off you may be fine but then i wouldn't bet on it um, and that's been our experience with people when they don't plan so um the design of a portfolio sean uh i, I know we're talking around this but Tell me why that is so important. I mean, what do you do with, with that to make sure that, that it's going to last the longest? Talk to that for me. Uh, so, you know, having a long-term focused investment portfolio, the management of that is obviously very important. Um, we believe in diversification and making gradual changes to how you're invested based on market and economic cycles. Um, but, you know, Something, a saying we're all familiar with is you don't put your eggs in one basket, right? So it's especially true in the investing world. Um, if you're, you know, planning long-term planning, um, and kind of how you're structured is based on your timeline and your, your tolerance of volatility. If you can't stomach seeing any volatility, you very conservatively invested. But if all of your eggs are in one or two baskets, um, you're gonna go on a much wilder ride, right? Um, there are dozens of different types of investment categories. Um, actually, I have a, uh, one of my favorite pieces to use for clients, which may not be as effective now that I think about it without having it here with me, but just have some imagination with me. Um, it's called a Skittle chart. So what it does is it assigns a very bright color to each um, investment category or asset class, and then it essentially ranks their returns every year for you know, the last 30 years. The best performing ones are at the top, and then the worst performing ones are at the bottom. So if you just follow one color, which is a very specific category, sometimes it's way up, then it goes way down, then it flows along the middle, then it's way up, then it's way down. So it's big peaks, big valleys. So part of long-term investing is trying to shrink that volatility a little bit. Still perform on the upside, volatility is going to happen, um, but try to, based on your situation, kind of minimize that as much as possible. Um, you know, like Dana said, um, people are emotional about money. There's no denying it. So when there's a volatile time or if we're in a down market, kind of like the last couple months, people have an emotional reaction. They kind of get a little panicky and, and you know, all of a sudden they'll say, you know, let's sell, let's go to cash. Um, but something else can we're taught at a young age is you buy low and sell high. So because people are acting emotionally, they want to sell when there's a downturn. Um, and then they always say, oh, we'll move back in once things get better. Trying to time the market is very difficult. Um, chances are, if you're selling out, if you're selling out, the downturns already happened, and by the time you get back in, the upswings already happened. If it was easy, um, you know, we'd all probably be millionaires at brunch drinking champagne right now. But it's not easy. Um, and kind of the long part of long-term investing in, is you kind of you need to zoom out of just not, not focus on what happened yesterday, not what's happened in the last couple months. Um, it's you know having a conversation with your advisor of this is where we where we've been, this is where we are now. These are expectations moving forward, and this is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and, like Dana said, a big part of our, our job is you know, kind of talking people through their emotions. So 
and reminding them this is why we're invested this way, these are the changes we've made. Remember initially when we started this, if we need to make any changes, we will. Um, but, you know, it's just a reminder, we're long-term focused. So what's happening right now, yeah, if we need to make gradual changes, we will, but we don't need to blow everything up. So we not only have psychology of plan or not plan, but there's a psychology of sticking with the plan once you have it. And, and it's, it's kind of hard these days with all the craziness going on. I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd put $75 of gas in an automobile. I, because I remember, we probably all remember 17 cents a gallon, right, in the 60s. Uh, so it, it's hard to do that. And if you look at the portfolio, you know, we live on the third floor of a building. And you look at it and you go, geez, am I going to jump? You know, it's crazy. <laughs> well, it's part of the... The planning process, the conversation is. Well, if you have a plan, yeah. as opposed to not having a plan, if you don't have a plan, what, what are you trying to do? If, if you're the type of personality where you're thinking about jumping off the third floor because of some volatility, it would put you in a portfolio where maybe it wouldn't be so volatile. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd probably go to my neighbor and say, why don't you jump first, and I'll see how that works. <laughs> my neighbor happens to be here. I'm jumping. Uh, so this is a sixty thousand dollar question. How do you guys get paid? It's a it's a great question, and I'm actually really happy to talk about this because I think um, another like misnomer about financial advisors and the industry in general is that we're only here for rich people, right? If you're not rich, you shouldn't have a financial advisor, and really couldn't be further from the truth. Financial advisors work with everyone that has money, has questions about money, which we know is everyone, and is looking for advice. That's what it is. Um, but the ways that financial advisors get paid is really important because I think just like in general going about your day, there are often times that you're waiting for the pitch, right? You're waiting for the sale and you're a little trepidatious of just not understanding how a professional works and how they make money and, and all of that. So um, this is not unique to Dana and Sean at Evershore Financial. Um, the most common ways, I'll talk about the most common ways and then I'll talk about some that are less common or even really fading away. Um, so one of the ways financial advisors make money is off of commissions. Um, things that you need, we've talked about them, long-term care, life insurance, short-term disability, all of those things. As financial advisors match you up with the company that's right for you, for whatever you should need, that company pays commission. Your price that you're paying, your premium, or anything that you're paying should not go up or down based on the company paying a commission. And whatever company you work with, whether you go to Joe Schmo on the corner, whether you go to a firm that's independent, whatever it is, when they match you up with that company, that company's gonna pay commission and you're gonna pay the premium based on whatever it is that you're needing and your health and all the factors that go into it. So that's one way that financial advisors make money. A second way financial advisors make money is assets under management, which is a very fancy term for just saying the money that you have invested. Um, so money that is invested that you're looking for guidance for somebody else to manage for you, um, they will make a, a, a percentage of those assets. So just industry standard starts at about 1%, and as the amount of money being invested goes up, the fee goes down. So it's a reverse sliding scale, but it starts at about 1% is what you can kind of baseline. Um, and then a third way that um, most financial advisors make money is off of what Sean talked about earlier, doing fee-based financial planning, where we're acting in a fiduciary way, you're, pay you're paying a flat fee that is a direct correlation to the amount of hours going into being worked um, to create that plan. So that's three ways that most advisors, financial advisors make money. Um, if you have a brokerage account and you are looking for individual stocks, an advisor might make a commission on your brokerage account. 
Um, it is less common now because we, you know, we really like to deal with funds that are more balanced. Talking to, you know, what Sean just the points that all the points that Sean just made. Um, but those are th those are the main ways that financial advisors get paid, and it's really important that you guys have that knowledge. So then you're in control of of when you're seeking out advice. So let's go on, uh, Sean. If somebody has a financial plan, how often do they have it reviewed, and are there life events that would cause uh, a trigger to get it reviewed? Uh, yeah. So financial plan should be uh, minimum minimum. Say the word minimally. Still don't know if I said it right. Uh, uh, minimally. <laughs> but I work with money and not. And not <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, at least annually. Uh, that's the minimum. Um, as far as uh, sorry, I'm shocked I can't say that word. Um, but really, the review is just to make sure that nothing uh, major has changed financially. To review investment accounts and just really make sure we're on the same. We're going the same direction that we want to be heading to get to where we want to be. Um, you know, whenever I'm looking at uh, financial planning reports that show information or projections way out into the future, I always make a point to tell the client, um, money is not this linear. This is based on what we have right now, today. As your finances change, something happens, this is going to change too, but we'll be able to plan for it. Um, as far as life events uh, that can trigger it, uh, I mean, marriage, having kids, getting divorced, starting a business, selling a business, selling a house, buying investment property, um, you know, retiring, there's a million different things that could trigger a review. And reviews don't always have to be just this formal once a year. I mean, some people like to meet quarterly, some like, like to meet semi-annually. But a lot of the time, it's just a out of the blue phone call. If someone has a question because something's happening in their life, you know. Or but, but for a senior, for it could be things like the death of a child, and you're going to need to start helping with finances yeah. for the grandchildren and the surviving yeah. spouse. Yeah, the death of a spouse. Yeah, I mean, life is random. So it, it, that's why it, it could be that a relative, another relative, uh, uh, passes and they receive money. Yep, inheritance, um, anything. There's so many things that happen that people aren't expecting to happen that affects their finances. And when that happens, you get a phone call and say, you know, hey, this happened, you know, or I'm thinking about doing this, and we can essentially run an alternative scenario to where we are today. Say, what if we did this, this, and this, and how it impacts the long run. Um, so uh, the short answer is at least annually. The long answer is whenever they have a question or something happens. And obviously, before you run out of your third floor balcony. And before you jump, yeah. So, uh, sure let's open up to questions. Uh, what questions do we have? Um, they've got the microphones, so hold them, let them hold the microphone so you get picked up on the PA system, and then I'll repeat the question to make sure we get it out. I've had long-term care insurance for a long time. It's a company I worked with provided it years ago, so I probably had it for 30 years. And to tell you the truth, I don't even know what to tell you. I'm actually a little I don't really want to call them and ask them to send me information because they have not raised my rates in a long time. I don't want to like, hmm. So I don't know what it covers. And, and, and I guess really, is it just used in a health center in the so let me repeat the question. She's had a long-term care policy for a very long time. She says it's a call of the company. And the question, I think, involves what, what does it cover? And then we'll let you answer the other piece. It covers health-related issues, and it's all spelled out in the contract. So you're going to need to get a copy of the contract and let a financial person review it so they can tell you exactly what it covers and what you guys want to input. Yeah, just, that's what I was going to say. Is the best way to know what it covers and the details around it is just to have a copy of the contract. If you don't have a copy, the only way to get it is to call the insurance company. I highly doubt, I would be surprised if a call from you triggered them raising rates. I mean, they're, if they wanted to raise rates, they would do it whether you They know how to find you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you may very well have a clause in your policy that says your rate's frozen. Yeah, there's, and what a long-term care policy covers is really dependent on the carrier and the type of contract, so knowing the specifics of that, you have to have the actual, your actual contract to see what it does cover. So it can cover 
and we have professionals that review those for people all the time, whether it be the financial folks or our uh, elbow attorney reviews those. So what else, Fish? Um, yeah, so most of the long-term uh, uh, Things, that's what we call it. I guess the long term contracts. Do they go for a certain period of time and then expire, or is this like if you're in the nursing home and you've used up seven years or something? Is there a discontinued phase of most of them or not? So I think what you're asking is once a, a long term care policy is enacted and starts paying out, do they have a finite period of time where the, the, beyond that there's no more money left, or do they go on forever? So either one you got. The ugly answer again, it depends. It depends on your policy. Um, and you know, if if you don't have one, there's all the there's all different options. There's options that only have coverage for a certain amount of time. There are options that have coverage until your death. Um, you know, literally infinite amount of time once it's once it's turned on. So that that's part of all the options I was talking about. And uh, there, I know there's some things we talk very generally. Uh, when you get a policy, they'll talk about what it pays out for a period of time, and they'll start throwing dollar amounts out. Just because it can pay out a given dollar amount doesn't mean you have to take that much money. If it pays out four thousand, doesn't mean you have to take four. You can take three and make it last longer. The important thing, though, is if you don't know what your long-term care policy says, then you've got a problem because you're planning. In a void. You're making a plan to get in your car and drive somewhere with the headlights off after dark and you have no idea how much gas is in the tank. So it, it's critical that you know what's in those policies and have a professional, because it's all legalese, have a professional review it and explain it to you. Just to kind of jump on that, you also should know what the process of filing the claim is. So when the time comes, what do I need to do to get the benefit? Because typically there's an elimination period where you have, you have a certain period of time before they'll start the benefit. Um, there needs to be physicians, um, notes, he's got to submit a document. There's just there's some hoops you have to jump through to, before you, you actually start receiving the benefits. So you should be aware of what the steps are ahead of time. And just to do that, you can work with an advisor and, and call the insurance company and they'll tell you. And, and uh, those elimination periods can be as much as 90 days. Some are 30, but again, you don't have some policy. Some you, you don't know. Okay, yeah. So what else do we have? Yes, ma'am. I've had a long-term policy. Here comes Kim. I've had a long-term policy that's been going on forever, which I do have all the documentation for. I care about that. But I wonder if the new models that usually go now towards having like a life insurance clause where you have if you don't use it, it can be you can have a beneficiary. And I don't know what age you can change it. Uh, you said 75 for buying, but what about changing? Is it too late to do that? You're not likely to do that. By changing so the, the question is, uh, if, if somebody has a policy in place, is there an ability to change that, move it to a different kind of policy? And I'm gonna let you guys touch that. Uh, with long-term care, not that I'm aware of. Once, pretty much once an insurance policy is in place, kind of is what it is. Yeah. So the thing with the age of 75, that's just typically kind of the mac the cap age that an insurance company will set for offering traditional long-term care coverage. And like Dana said, there are some other options beyond that. Um, but to kind of once you're past that, it's hard to make any changes. Um, you can't retroactively go back and say, I want to add this to it. Okay. Okay. Even more reason to make sure that somebody's gone through the whole thing and, and put it in English for us, right? At least English we can read, not, not legal. Um, anything else? Okay, Bob. Here you go. Kim needs exercise, so we got him. Uh, I know it's very easy to say that everybody should have long term care, but over the years when I was researching, the premiums are so expensive, most middle class people can't afford it. But if you tell me today, this gentleman is going to be 35 years old, couple, and they want long term care, what are the premiums? 
So the, the, the comment was about the expense of long-term care, which we can debate all day. Um, and then what would a premium be? And, and that may be hard to answer, I understand. That premium be for a person, let's say in their 50s. Uh, it depends. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's hard to say. So the reason long-term care insurance is expensive, that is a big problem, is expensive. Is because long-term care is expensive. In order to generate the pool of money you'll need to cover long-term care, it's gotta, it's gotta be a decent amount of money. Um, as far as the cost, it depends how you're paying it, depends on the type of policy. Um, it depends on age, health. Age, health, yeah, if it's something where you have to go through traditional underwriting, um, if it's something where there is no underwriting, it doesn't come in back here sometimes. If you're, if you're married, they'll give you a discount. Um, there's all kinds of ways. I, I, I can't give you like a specific answer of it'll be this. I think if we say 10 people in the room that ha happen to have it and we all sit down and wrote a long piece of paper, the very, the, the uh, premiums would be vastly different. What I will say is you're exactly right. It is quite expensive, um, but for some people, they can stomach the monthly premium. And for some people, they would rather move a sum of money, $75,000. $100,000, $150,000, and I'm not sneezing, that is a lot of money. But if it is sitting in some other investment, and it could be moved, essentially it's just moving from one, one bank account to another, and if you need it, it can be tapped and hedged for long-term care. And so that's the type of options that are available now that maybe weren't when someone originally researched it, and maybe that's easier to stomach than a high monthly premium. It really can fit your needs, and at the end of the day, you're right, it, it could be costly, absolutely. The alternative, though, is costlier. But there's one of the kinds of policies that's available today is a combination of long-term care insurance and a life insurance policy. It's paid off completely in a matter of years and it's a lump sum payment on an annual basis that's one kind that's out there that's that's palatable to some people because it, another benefit of that policy is that if someone has to tap into the long-term care insurance the premiums go away they paid off so there's there's it's, it's like going and buying a car it depends on what you want are the premiums and long-term care generally fixed, or do they go up over the time of inflation? Okay, the question is about how the premiums work um, going up or are fixed. And I kind of answered part of that question, but I'll let you guys. In the past, they were more uh, variable, but there was some escalators. Now, a lot of them are fixed, where you can say, you know, I want to pay $5,000 a year for 10 years as a premium, or however you want to design it. Um, in the past, there was more um, there are escalators built in just in order to for the insurance company to guarantee what the contracts are. Um, so it's more and more common though where you can have it fixed. I'm annoying myself, but it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of beat up long term care insurance. <laughs> I was going to add one more thing about the long term care. I've heard some ages um, also. Um, what about our 40 ish kids? Should we be saying that they need to start planning now? Are they healthy and have two incomes? What what about advice we can pass on to our children? I'm so so the question is about about uh, what about our children? And there's a lot we can talk about with our children. But <laughs> we get off on a lot of different subjects. And really, the long term care insurance. What should we be telling our, our adult children who unfortunately are getting older? Yeah, I'm happy you asked because obviously you know. We, we talk a lot about those of us in the room, but we know you have adult children that you are also trying to still lead, lead the way. Yeah, the earlier the better applies to them too. Um, it's cheaper when you're younger. Um, the options are there now. We definitely see most people when they get into their 40s and 50s is when, is when they really start looking at it, and that coincides with our parents' aging. Right, so it all happens at the same time, but the earlier the better totally applies to your adult children too. Definitely encourage them to speak with their advisor or help them, you know, get connected with somebody that you respect. As well as have a financial plan, which is important. And I'm gonna soapbox for a minute. Make sure your children have wills. Make sure they have designated 
who's going to care for their children when they're both killed in a car accident. Otherwise, they're moving in with you. Think about that. You know, how many of us, well, we love our grandchildren, and we love that they go home at night after a couple of days, but we don't need them coming and living with us for the rest of our lives. Um, one more question. Who has a question? We miss anyone? Um, so closing, what did we miss? What do you guys have to say of absolute words of wisdom here? I think what we want, and Sean will add to this, but I think what we want you to hear is that is the word planning. It's a really powerful word, planning. Um, you know, we don't like to say if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, but what if you got hit by a bus yesterday? What happened? What happened with your money? What happened? What now are your adult children dealing with? And if you're not comfortable with what's already in place, find someone to help plan. Yeah, um, you know, I think we're all guilty of saying, you know, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, pushing things off in you know, any facet of life. Um, but doing it in you know these kind of situations, you know, money is a big part of people's life, right? Um, so kind of putting off decisions or putting off making plans, eventually it's just going to blow up in your face. Maybe not your face, but someone you love's face. Um, so just try to not procrastinate like, and plan. I guess is the, the overall theme. Look at the big picture. So did we try to say anything? Good, because we're not here to say anything. Um, all the partners are going to stick around afterwards in the back of the room. Uh, and feel free to talk to them, pick their brains, learn what they have to say, and uh, certainly schedule appointments to, to see them, go to the communities, to meet the financial, set up financial plans. Unfortunately, our elder law attorney couldn't make it today. Uh, we've got some great people. Sonata Communities here, it's brand new, coming out of the ground. Uh, Rachel's from Providence, which is a brand new community in Maitland. Memory care, we have uh, those personal friends who have their parents there. Uh, wonderful community. Um, yes? What's the name of your eldest law attorney? Linda Solash-Reed. And if you see Lynn uh, Henderson afterwards, she'll, uh, I think Linda has a... So we, uh, now for you people who are new, uh, we have your email address, so you get an email from us. Uh, advertising the next seminar. Uh, we're not going to send you anything to sell you anything. Uh, you are only going to get emails on that. If Lynn and I occasionally get invited to speak for other groups, and if we're doing that, we may invite you to that. Uh, so we'll, if you see one of those, but we're not going to send anything to you trying to, to get you to, uh, to sell. Um, so what do you do if we can learn today? I trust you in a set of meeting to get a financial plan or make sure the one you have is in good shape. Or maybe it maybe it, it, it made you think, um, I better start going out looking at communities because mom may need to be in one or I may be wanting to go to one sometime soon. Or schedule with uh, Linda Solash Reed uh, to look at the legal documents. Um, you're the connection of the world. You've learned in here uh, impartial information. It wasn't what you heard in the grocery store and what they said or what you heard. It's from the, the experts, and I think that's very important. I really challenge you to invite somebody next month to come. We really want to fill this room with people and spread the word. And uh, as always, I have a closing quote. And you must gain control over your money by doing a financial plan, or your money will forever control you. And that's by Dave Ramsey. Thank you so much for coming. God bless and have a wonderful week.